Chapter Twenty Two of A Girl the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two, wherein Philip Ammon kneels to the Queen of Love and Chicago comes to the Limberlost. The month which followed was a reproduction of the previous June. There were long moth hunts, days of specimen gathering, wonderful hours with great books, big dinners all of them helped to prepare, and perfect nights filled with music. Everything was as it had been, with the difference that Philip was now an avowed suitor. He missed no opportunity to advance himself in Elnora's graces. At the end of the month he was no nearer any sort of understanding with her than he had been at the beginning. He reveled in the privilege of loving her, but he got no response. Elnora believed in his love, yet she hesitated to accept him, because she could not forget Edith Carr. One afternoon early in July, Ammon came across the fields, through the Comstock woods, and entered the garden. He inquired for Elnora at the back door and was told that she was reading under the willow. He went around the west end of the cabin to her. She sat on a rustic bench they had made and placed beneath a drooping branch. Ammon had not seen her before in the dress she was wearing. It was clinging mole of pale green trimmed with narrow ruffles and touched with knots of black velvet. A simple dress, but vastly becoming. Every tint of her bright hair, her luminous eyes, her red lips and rose-flushed face, neck and arms grew a little more vivid with the delicate green setting. Ammon stopped short. She was so near, so temptingly sweet, he lost control. He went to her with a half-smothered cry after that first long look, dropped on one knee beside her and reached an arm behind her to the bench back, so that he was very near. He caught her hands. Oh, Nora, he cried tensely, end it now. Say the strain is over. I pledge you that you will be happy. You don't know. If you only would say the words, you would awake to new life and great joy. Won't you promise me now, El Nora? The girl sat staring into the west woods, while strong in her eyes was her father's look of seeing something invisible to others. Ammon's arm slipped from the bench around her. His fingers closed firmly over hers. His face came very near. Oh, Nora, he pleaded, you know me well enough. You have had time and plenty. And it now, say you will be mine. He gathered her closer, pressing his face against hers, his breath on her cheek. Can't you quite promise yet, my girl, the limber lost? Elnora shook her head. Instantly he released her. Forgive me, he begged. I had no intention of thrusting myself upon you, but, Elnora, you are the veriest queen of love this afternoon. From the tips of your toes to your shining crown I worship you. All my life I will. I want no woman save you. You are so wonderful this afternoon I couldn't help urging. Forgive me. Perhaps it was something that came this morning for you. I wrote Polly to send it. May we just try it if it fits? Will you tell me if you like it? He drew a little white velvet box from his pocket and showed her a splendid emerald ring. It may not be right, he said. The inside of a glove finger is not very accurate for a measure, but it was the best I could do. I wrote Polly to get it, because she and Mother are home from the east this week, but next they will go on to our cottage in the north, and no one knows what is right quite so well as Polly. He laid the ring in Elnora's hand. Dearest, he said, don't slip that on your finger, put your arms around my neck and promise me all at once and abruptly, or I'll keel over and die of sheer joy. Elnora smiled. I won't, not all those venturesome things at once. But, Phil, I'm ashamed to confess that ring simply fascinates me. It is the most beautiful one I ever saw, and do you know that I never owned a ring of any kind in my life? Would you think me unwomanly if I slip it on just a second before I can say for sure? Phil, you know I care. I care very much. You know I will tell you the instant I feel right about it. Certainly you will, agreed Ammon promptly. It is your right to take all the time you choose. I can't put that ring on you until it means a bond between us. I'll shut my eyes and you try it on so we can see if it fits and looks well. Philip turned his face toward the west woods and tightly closed his eyes. It was a boyish thing to do and it caught the hesitating girl in the depths of her heart as the boy element in a man ever appeals to a motherly woman. Before she quite realized what she was doing, the ring slid on her finger. With both arms she caught Ammon and drew him to her breast, holding him closely. Her head drooped over his, her lips were on his hair. So an instant, then her arms dropped. Ammon lifted a convulsed, white face. "'Dear Lord,' he whispered, "'you, you didn't mean that, Elnora. You—what made you do it?' 
"You you look so boyish," panted Eleanor. "I didn't mean it. I I forgot that you were older than Billy. Look! A look at the ring!" She thrust her hand before him to distract his attention. "'The Queen can do no wrong,'" quoted Ammon between his set teeth. "'But don't you do that again, Elnora, unless you do mean it. Kings are not so good as queens, and there is a limit with all men. As you say, we will look at your ring. It seems very lovely to me. Suppose you leave it on until time for me to go.' "'Please do. I have heard of mute appeals. Perhaps it will plead for me. I am wild for your lips this afternoon. I am going to take your hands.' He caught both of them and covered them with kisses. He lifted his face. Elnora, he said, will you be my wife? I must have a little more time, she whispered. I must be absolutely certain, for when I say yes and give myself to you, only death shall part us. I would not give you up, so I want just a little more time, but I think I will. Thank you, said Ammon. If at any time you feel that you have reached a decision, will you tell me? I don't feel as if I could lose a second waiting to stumble on that fact. Will you promise me to tell me instantly, or shall I keep asking you until the time comes? You make it difficult, said Elnora, but I will promise you that. Whenever the last doubt vanishes, I will let you know instantly, if I can. Would it be hard for you? whispered Ammon. I... I don't know, faltered Elnora. It seems as if I can't be man enough to put this thought aside and give up this afternoon, said Ammon. I'm ashamed of myself, but I can't help it. I'm going to ask God to make that last doubt vanish before I go this night. I'm going to believe that ring will plead for me. I'm going to hope that doubt will disappear suddenly. I will be watching. Every second I will be watching. If it happens and you can't speak, give me your hand. Just the least movement toward me, I will understand. Would it help you to talk it over with your mother? Shall I call her? Shall I... Honk! 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 Hart Henderson set the alarm of the big automobile going as it shot from behind the trees lining the brushwood road. The picture of a vine-covered cabin, a great drooping tree, a green-clad girl, and a man bending over her very closely flashed into view. Edith Carr caught her breath with a snap. Polly Ammon gave Tom Levering a quick touch and wickedly winked at him. Several days before, Edith had returned from Europe suddenly. She and Henderson had called at the Ammon residence, saying that they were going to motor down to the Limberlost to see Philip a few hours, and urged that Polly and Tom accompany them. Mrs. Ammon knew that her husband would disapprove of the trip, but it was easy to see that Edith Carr had determined on going. So the mother thought it better to have Polly along to support Philip than to allow him to confront Edith unexpectedly and alone. Polly was full of spirit. She did not relish the thought of Edith as a sister. Always they had been in the same set. Always Edith, because of greater beauty and wealth, had patronized Polly. Although it had rankled, she had borne it sweetly. But two days before, her father had extracted a promise of secrecy, given her Philip's address, and told her to send him the finest emerald ring she could select. Polly knew how the ring would be used. What she did not know was that the girl who accompanied her went back to the store afterward, made an excuse to the clerk that she had been sent to be absolutely sure that the address was right, and so secured it for Edith Carr. Two days later, Edith had induced Hart Henderson to take her to Onabasha. By the aid of maps, they located the Comstock land and passed it, merely to see the place. Henderson hated that trip and implored Edith not to take it, but she made no effort to conceal from him what she suffered, and it was more than he could endure. He pointed out that Philip had gone away without leaving an address because he did not wish to see her or any of them. But Edith was so sure of her power, she felt certain Philip needed only to see her, to succumb to her beauty as he always had done, while now she was ready to plead for forgiveness. So they came down the brushwood road, and Henderson had just said to Edith beside him, This should be the Comstock land on our left. A minute later the wood ended, while the sunlight, as always pitiless, etched with distinctness the scene at the west end of the cabin. Instinctively, to save Edith, Henderson set the whistle blowing. He had thought to go on to the city, but Polly Ammon stood crying, Phil! Phil! Tom Levering was on his feet shouting and waving, while Edith, in her most imperial manner, ordered him to turn into the lane leading through the woods beside the cabin. "'Fix it some way that I get a minute alone with her,' she commanded as he stopped the car. "'That is my sister Polly, her fiancé, Tom Levering, a friend of mine named Henderson, and—' began Ammon. 
"'And Edith Carr,' volunteered Elnor. "'And Edith Carr,' repeated Philip Hammond. "'Oh, Nora, be brave for my sake. "'Their coming can make no difference in any way. "'I won't let them stay but a few minutes. "'Come with me.' "'Do I look scared?' inquired Elnor serenely. "'This is why you haven't had your answer. "'I have been waiting just six weeks for that motor. "'You may bring them to me at the arbor.' Ammon glanced at her and broke into a laugh. She had not lost color. Her self-possession was perfect. She deliberately turned and walked toward the grape arbor, while he sprang over the west fence and ran to the car. Elnora, standing in the arbor entrance, made a perfect picture, framed in green leaves and tendrils. No matter how her heart ached, it was good to her, for it pumped steadily and kept her cheeks and lips suffused with color. She saw Philip reach the car and gather her sister into his arms. Past her, he reached a hand to Levering, then to Edith Carr and Henderson. He lifted his sister to the ground and assisted Edith to alight. Instantly, she stepped beside him, and Elnora's heart played its first trick. She could see that Miss Carr was splendidly beautiful while she moved with the hauteur and grace supposed to be the prerogatives of royalty, and she had instantly taken possession of Philip Ammon. But Ammon also had a brain which was working with rapidity. He knew Elnora was watching, so he swung around to the others. "'Give her up, Tom,' he cried. "'I didn't know I wanted to see the little nuisance so badly, but I do. How are father and mother? Polly, didn't the matter send me something?' "'She did,' said Polly Ammon, stopping on the path and lifting her chin as a little child, while she drew away her veil. Philip caught her in his arms and stooped for his mother's kiss. "'Be good to Elnora,' he whispered. "'Uh-huh,' uh -huh, assented Polly, in a loud look at that ripping green and gold symphony i never saw such a beauty thomas asquith levering you come straight here and take my hand edith's move to compel ammon to approach elnora beside her had been easy to see also its failure henderson stepped into ammon's place as he turned to his sister instead of taking polly's hand levering ran to open the gate Edith passed through first, but Polly darted in front of her on the run, with Phil holding her arm, and swept up to Elnora. Polly looked for the ring and saw it. That settled matters with her. "'You lovely, lovely, darling girl!' she cried, throwing her arms around Elnora and kissing her. With her lips near Elnora's ear, Polly whispered, "'Sister, dear, dear sister!' Elnora drew back, staring at Polly in confused amazement. She was a beautiful girl, dressed in some wonderful way. Her eyes were sparkling and dancing, and as she turned to make way for the others, she kept one of Elnora's hands in hers. Polly would have dropped very dead in that instant if Edith Carr could have killed with a look, for not until then did she realize that Polly would even many a slight, and that had been a great mistake to bring her. Edith bowed low, muttered something, and touched Elnora's fingers. Tom Levering took his cue from Polly. I always follow a good example, he said, and before anyone could divine his intention, he kissed Elnora as he gripped her hand and cried, Mighty glad to meet you. Like to meet you a dozen times a day, you know. Elnora laughed and her heart pumped smoothly. They had accomplished their purpose. They had let her know they were there through compulsion, but on her side. In that instant, only pity was in Elnora's breast for the flashing dark beauty, standing with smiling face while her heart must have been filled with exceeding bitterness. Elnora stepped back from the entrance. "'Come into the shade,' she urged. "'You must have found it warm on these country roads. "'Won't you lay aside your dust coats and have a cool drink? "'Philip, would you ask Mother to come and bring that pitcher in the spring house?' They entered the arbor, exclaiming at the dim, green coolness. There was plenty of room and wide seats around the sides, a table in the center, on which lay a piece of embroidery, magazines, books, the moth apparatus, and the cyanide jar containing several specimens. Polly rejoiced in the cooling shade, slipped off her duster, removed her hat, rumpled her pretty hair, and seated herself to indulge in the delightful occupation of paying off old scores. Tom Levering followed her example. Edith took a seat but refused to remove her hat and coat while Henderson stood in the entrance. "'There goes something with wings. Should you have that?' cried Levering. He seized a net from the table and raced across the garden after a butterfly. He caught it and came back mightily pleased with himself. As the creature struggled in the net, Elnora noted a repulsed look on Edith Carr's face. Levering helped the situation beautifully. "'Now what have I got?' he demanded. "'Is it just a common one that everyone knows and you don't keep? Or is it the rarest bird off the perch?' 
"You must have had practice, you took that so perfectly," said Eleanor. "I am sorry, but it is quite common and not of a kind I keep. Suppose all of you see how beautiful it is, and that it may go nectar hunting again." She held the butterfly where all of them could see, showed its upper and under wing colours, answered Polly's questions as to what it ate, how long it lived, and how it died. Then she put it into Polly's hands, saying, Stand there in the light and loosen your hold slowly and easily. Elnora caught a brush from the table and began softly stroking the creature's sides and wings. Delighted with the sensation, the butterfly slowly opened and closed its wings, clinging to Polly's soft little fingers, while everyone cried out in surprise. Elnora laid aside the brush and the butterfly sailed away. Why, you are a wizard! You charm them! marveled Levering. I learned that from the bird woman, said Elnora. She takes soft brushes and coaxes butterflies and moths into the positions she wants for the illustrations of a book she is writing. I have helped her often. Most of the rare ones I get go to her. Then you don't keep all you take, questioned Levering. Oh, dear, no, cried Elnora. Not a tenth. For myself, a pair of each kind to use in illustrating the lectures I give in the city schools in the winter, and one pair for each collection I make. One might just as well keep the big night moths of June, for they only live four or five days anyway. For the bird woman, I only save rare ones she has not yet secured. Sometimes I think it is cruel to take such creatures from freedom, even for an hour, but it is the only way to teach the masses of people how to distinguish the pests they should destroy from the harmless ones of great beauty, and secure propagation privileges for them. Here comes Mother with something cool to drink. Mrs. Comstock came deliberately, talking to Ammon as she approached. Elnora gave her one searching look, but could discover only an extreme brightness of eye to denote any unusual feeling. She wore one of her lavender dresses, while her snowy hair was high-piled. She had taken care of her complexion, and her face had grown fuller during the winter. She might have been anyone's mother with pride, and she was perfectly at ease. Polly instantly went to her and held up her face to be kissed. Mrs. Comstock's eyes twinkled, and she made the greeting hearty. The drink was compounded of the juices of oranges and berries from the garden. It was cool enough to frost glasses and pitcher, and delicious to dusty, tired travelers. Soon the pitcher was empty, and Elnora picked it up and went to refill it. While she was gone, Henderson asked Philip about some trouble he was having with his car. They went to the woods and began a minute examination to find a defect which did not exist. Polly and Levering were having an animated conversation with Mrs. Comstock. Henderson saw Edith arise, follow the garden path next the woods, and stand waiting under the willow which Elnora would pass on her return. It was for that meeting he had made the trip. He got down on the ground, tore up the car, worked, asked for help, and kept Philip busy screwing bolts and applying the oil can. All the time Henderson kept an eye on Edith and Elnora under the willow, but he took pains to lay the work he asked Philip to do where that scene would be out of his sight. When Elnora came around the corner with the pitcher, she found herself facing Edith Carr. "'I want a minute with you,' said Miss Carr. "'Very well,' replied Elnora, walking on. "'Set the pitcher on the bench there,' commanded Edith Carr, as if speaking to a servant. "'I prefer not to offer my guests a warm drink,' said Elnora. "'I'll come back if you really wish to speak with me.' "'I came solely for that,' said Edith Carr. It would be a pity to travel so far in this dust and heat for nothing. I'll only be gone a second. Elnora set the pitcher before her mother. Please serve this, she said. Miss Carr wishes to speak with me. Well, don't you pay the least attention to anything she says, cried Polly. Tom and I didn't come here because we wanted to. We just came to checkmate her. I hoped I'd get the opportunity to say a word to you, and now she has given it to me. I just want to tell you that she threw Phil over in perfectly horrid style. All of us detest her for it as much as he does. She hasn't any right to lay the ghost of a claim to him, has she, Tom? Nary a claim, said Tom Levering earnestly. Why, even you, Polly, couldn't serve me as she did Phil and ever get me back again. If I were you, Miss Comstock, I'd send my mother to talk with her and I'd stay here. Tom had gauged Mrs. Comstock rightly. Polly put her arms around Elnora. Let me go with you, dear, she begged. I promised I would speak with her alone, said Elnora, and she has to be considered, but thank you very much. How I shall love you, exulted Polly, giving Elnora a parting hug. The girl slowly and gravely walked back to the willow. She could not imagine just what was coming, but she was promising herself that she would be very patient 
and control her temper. "'Will you be seated?' she asked politely. Edith Carr glanced at the bench while a shudder shook her. "'No, I prefer to stand,' she said. "'Did Mr. Ammon give you the ring you are wearing, and do you consider yourself engaged to him?' "'By what right do you ask such personal questions as those?' inquired Elnor. "'By the right of a betrothed wife. I have been promised to Philip Ammon ever since I wore short skirts. All our lives we have expected to marry. An agreement of years cannot be broken in one insane moment. Always he has loved me devotedly. Give me ten minutes with him, and he will be mine for all time.' "'I seriously doubt that,' said Elnor but I am perfectly willing that you should make the test. I will call him. Stop, commanded Edith Carr. I told you that was you I came to see. I remember, said Elnor. Mr. Emmon is my betrothed, continued Edith Carr. I expect to take him back to Chicago with me. You expect considerable, murmured Elnor. I will raise no objection to your taking him if you can, but I tell you frankly I don't think it possible. "'You are so sure of yourself as that,' scoffed Edith Carr. "'One hour in my presence will bring back the old spell, full force. "'We belong to each other. I will not give him up.' "'Then it is untrue that you twice rejected his ring, "'repeatedly insulted him, and publicly renounced him?' "'That was through you,' cried Edith Carr. "'Phil and I never have been so near and so happy as we were on that night. "'It was your clinging to him for things that caused him to desert me among his guests "'while he tried to make me await your pleasure. "'I realize the spell of this place for a summer season. "'I understand what you and your mother have done to inveigle him. "'I know that your hold on him is quite real. "'I can see just how you have worked to ensnare him.' "'Men would call that lying,' said Elnora calmly. The second time I met Philip Ammon, he told me of his engagement to you, and I respected it. I did by you as I would want you to do by me. He was here parts of each day, almost daily, last summer. The Almighty is my witness that never once, by word or look, did I ever make the slightest attempt to interest him in my person or personality. He wrote you frequently in my presence. He forgot the violets for which he has to send you. I gathered them and carried them to him. I sent him back to you in unswerving devotion, and the Almighty is also my witness that I could have changed his heart last summer if I had tried. I wisely left that work for you. All my life I shall be glad that I lived and worked on the square, that he ever would come back to me free by your act. I never dreamed. When he left me, I did not hope or expect to see him again. Elnora's voice fell soft and low. And behold, you sent him and free you exult in that cried edith carr let me tell you he is not free we have belonged for years we always will if you cling to him and hold him to rash things he has said and done because he thought me still angry and unforgiving with him you will ruin all our lives if he married you before a month you would read heart hunger for me in his eyes he could not love me as he has done and give me up for a little scene like that there is a great poem said elnora one line of which reads, For each man kills the thing he loves. Let me tell you that a woman can do that also. He did love you, that I concede. But you killed his love everlastingly when you disgraced him in public, killed it so completely he does not even feel resentment towards you. Today he would do you a favor if he could, but love you, no, that is over. Edith Carr stood truly regal and filled with scorn. You are mistaken! "'Nothing on earth could kill that!' she cried, and Elnora saw that the girl really believed what she said. "'You are very sure of yourself,' said Elnora. "'I have reason to be sure,' answered Edith Carr. "'We have lived and loved too long. I have had years with him to match against your days. He is mine. His work, his ambitions, his friends, his place in society are with me.' You may have a summer charm for a sick man in the country. If he tried placing you in society, he soon would see you as others will. It takes birth to position, schooling, and endless practice to meet social demands gracefully. You would put him to shame in a week. I hardly think I should follow your example so far, said Elnora dryly. I have a feeling for Philip that would prevent my hurting him purposely, either in public or private. As for managing a social career for him, he never mentioned that he desired such a thing. What he asked of me was that I should be his wife. I understood that to mean that he desired me to keep him a clean house, 
serve him digestible food, mother his children, and give him loving sympathy and tenderness. Shameless! cried Edith Carr. To which of us do you intend that adjective to apply? inquired Elnora. I never was less ashamed in all my life. Please remember, I am in my own home, and your presence here is not on my invitation. Miss Carr lifted her head and struggled with her veil. She was very pale and trembling violently, while Elnora stood serene, a faint smile on her lips. Such vulgarity, panted Edith Carr. How can a man like Emin endure it? Why don't you ask him, inquired Elnor. I can call him with one breath. But if he judged us as we stand, I should not be the one to tremble at his decision. Miss Carr, you have been quite plain. You have told me in carefully selected words just what you think of me. You insult my birth, education, appearance, and home. I assure you I am legitimate. I will pass a test examination with you on any high school or supplementary branch or French or German. I will take a physical examination beside you. I will face any social emergency you can mention with you. I am acquainted with a whole world in which Philip Ammon is keenly interested that you scarcely know exists. I am not afraid to face any audience you can get together anywhere with my violin. I am not repulsive to look at, and I have a wholesome regard for the proprieties and civilities of life. Philip Ammon never asked anything more of me. Why should you? It is plain to see, cried Edith Carr, that you took him when he was hurt and angry and kept his wound wide open. Oh, what have you not done against me? I did not promise to marry him when an hour ago he asked me the last time and offered me this ring because there was so much feeling in my heart for you that I know I never could be happy if I felt that in any way I had failed in doing justice to your interests. I did slip on this ring which he had just brought, because I never owned one, and it is very beautiful, but I made him no promise, nor shall I make any, until I am quite, quite sure that you fully realize he never would marry you if I sent him away this hour. You know perfectly that if your puny hold on him were broken, if he were back in his house among his friends and where he was meeting me, in one little week he would be mine again as he always has been. In your heart you don't believe what you say. You don't dare trust him in my presence. You are afraid to allow him out of your sight because you realize what the results would be. Right or wrong, you have made up your mind to ruin him and me, and you are going to be selfish enough to do it. But that will do, said Elnora. Spare me the enumeration of how I will regret it. I shall regret nothing. I shall not act until I know there will be nothing to regret. I have decided on my course. You may return to your friends. "'What do you mean?' demanded Edith Carr. "'That is my affair,' replied Elnora. "'Only this. When your opportunity comes, seize it. Any time you are in Philip Ammon's presence, exert the charms of which you boast and take him. I grant you are justified in doing it if you can. I want nothing more than I want to see you marry Philip if he wants you. He is just across the fence under that automobile. Go spread your meshes and exert your wiles.' I won't stir to stop you. Take him to Onabasha and to Chicago with you. Use every art you possess. If the old charm can be revived, I will be the first to wish both of you well. Now, I must return to my guests. Kindly excuse me. Elnora turned and went back to the arbor. Edith Carr followed the fence and passed through the gate into the west woods, where she asked Henderson if the car was ready. As she stood near him, she whispered, Take Phil back to Onabasha with us. I say, Ammon, can't you go to the city with us and help me find a shop where I can get this pinion fixed? asked Henderson. We want to lunch and start back by five. That will get us home by midnight. Why don't you bring your automobile here? I am a working man, said Philip. I've no time to be out motoring. I can't see anything the matter with your car myself. But, of course, you don't want to break down in the night on strange roads with women on your hands. I'll see. Philip went into the arbor where Polly took possession of his lap, fingered his hair and kissed his forehead and lips. "'When are you coming to the cottage, Phil?' she asked. "'Come soon and bring Miss Comstock for a visit. All of us would be so glad to have her.' Philip beamed on Polly. "'I'll see about that,' he said. "'Sounds pretty good. Oh, Nora, Henderson is in trouble with his automobile. He wants me to go to Onabasha with him to show him where the doctor lives and help him get fixed so he can start back this evening. It will take about two hours. May I go?' "'Of course you must go,' she said, laughing lightly. "'You can't leave your sister. "'Why don't you go back to Chicago with them? "'There's plenty of room, and you could have a fine visit.' 
I'll be back in just two hours, said Amon. While I'm gone, you be thinking over what we were talking of when the folks came. Miss Comstock can go with us just as well as not, said Polly. That back seat was made for three, and I can sit on your lap. Come on, do come, urged Damon instantly, and Tom Levering joined him. But Henderson and Edith silently waited at the gate. No, thank you, laughed Elnora. That would crowd you, and it's warm and dusty. We will say good-bye here. She offered her hand to all of them, and when she came to Ammon, she gave him one long, steady look in the eyes, then shook hands with him also. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three, wherein Elnora reaches a decision and Freckles and the Angel appear. Well, she came, didn't she? Remarked Mrs. Comstock to Elnora as they watched the automobile speed down the road. As it turned the Limber Lost corner, Ammon arose and waved to them. She hasn't got him yet, anyway," said Mrs. Comstock, taking heart. What's that on your finger, and what did she say to you? Eleanor explained about the ring as she drew it off. I have several letters to write, then I'm going to change my dress and walk down toward Aunt Margaret's for a little exercise. I may meet some of them, and I don't want them to see this ring. You keep it until Philip comes, said Eleanor. As for what Miss Carr said to me, many things. Two of importance. One, that I lacked every social requirement necessary for the happiness of Philip Ammon, and that if I married him I would see inside a month that he was ashamed of me. Aw, oh, shockin', scorned Mrs. Comstock. Go on. The other was that she has been engaged to him for years, that he belongs to her, and she refuses to give him up. She said that if he were in her presence one hour, she would have him under a mysterious thing she calls her spell again. If he were where she could see him for one week, everything would be made up. It is her opinion that he is suffering from wounded pride, and that the slightest concession on her part will bring him to his knees before her. Mrs. Comstock giggled. I do hope the boy isn't weak-kneed, she said. I just happened to be passing the west window this afternoon. Elnora laughed. Nothing save actual knowledge ever would have made me believe there was a girl in all this world so infatuated with herself. She speaks casually of her power over men and boasts of bringing a man to his knees as complacently as I would pick up a net and say, I'm going to take a butterfly. She actually and honestly believes that if Philip were with her a little while, she could rekindle his love for her and awaken in him every particle of the old devotion. Mother, the girl is honest. She is absolutely sincere. She so believes in herself and the strength of Phil's love for her that all her life she will believe in and brood over that thought, unless she is taught differently. So long as she thinks that she will nurse wrong ideas and pine over her blighted life, she must be taught that Phil is absolutely free, and yet he will not go to her. But how on earth are you proposing to teach her that? The way will open. Looky here, Elnora, cried Mrs. Comstock. That car girl's the handsomest dark woman I ever saw. She's got to the place where she won't stop at anything. Her coming here proves that. I don't believe there was a thing the matter with that automobile. I think that was a scheme she fixed up to get Phil where she could see him, alone, as she worked to see you. If you are going deliberately to put Philip under her influence again, you've got to brace yourself for the possibility that she may win. A man is a weak mortal, where a lovely woman is concerned, and he never denied that he loved her once. You may make yourself downright miserable. But, Mother, if she won, it wouldn't make me half so miserable as to marry Phil myself and then read hunger for her in his eyes. Someone has got to suffer over this. If it proves to be me, I'll bear it, and you'll never hear a whisper of complaint from me. I know the real Philip Ammon better in our months of work in the fields, and she knows him in all her years of society engagements. So she shall have the hour she asked. Many, many of them, enough to make her acknowledge that she is wrong. Now I'm going to write my letters and take my walk. Elnora threw her arms around her mother and kissed her repeatedly. Don't you worry about me, she said. I will get along all right, and whatever happens, I always will be your girl and you, my darling mother. She left two sealed notes on her desk. Then she changed her dress, packed a small bundle, which she dropped with her hat from the window by the willow, and softly went downstairs. Mrs. Comstock was in the garden. 
Elnor picked up the hat and bundle, hurried down the road a few rods, then climbed the fence and entered the woods. She took a diagonal course and after a long walk reached a road two miles west and one south. There she straightened her clothing, put on her hat and the thin dark veil, and waited the passing of the next trolley. She left at the first town and took a train for Fort Wayne. She made that point just in time to climb on the evening train north as it pulled from the station. It was after midnight when she left the cart Grand Rapids and went to the depot to await the coming of day. Tired out, she laid her head on her bundle and fell asleep on the seat in the women's waiting room. Long after light, she was awakened by the roar and rattle of trains. She washed, rearranged her hair and clothing, and went into the general waiting room to find her way to the street. She saw him as he entered the door. There was no mistaking the tall, lithe figure, the bright hair, the lean, brown, splotched face, the steady gray eyes. He was dressed for traveling and carried a light overcoat and a bag. Straight to him, Elnora went speeding. Oh, I was just starting to find you, she cried. Thank you, he said. You are going away, she panted. Not if I'm needing. I have a few minutes. Can you be telling me briefly? I am the Limberlost girl to whom your wife gave the dress for commencement last spring, and both of you sent lovely gifts. There is a reason, a very good reason, why I must be hidden for a time, and I came straight to you, as if I had a right. You have, answered Freckles. Any boy or girl who ever suffered one pang in the Limberlost has a claim to the best drop of blood in my heart. You needn't be telling me anything more. The angel is at our cottage on Mackinac. You shall tell her and play with the babies while you want shelter. This way. They breakfasted in a luxurious car, talked over the swamp, the work of the bird woman. Elnora told of her nature lectures in the schools, and soon they were great friends. In the evening, they left the train at Mackinac City and crossed the straits by boat. Sheets of white moonlight flooded the water and paved a molten path across the breast of it, straight to the face of the moon. The island lay a dark spot on the silver surface, its tall trees sharply outlined on the summit, and a million lights blinked around the shore. The night guns boomed from the white fort, and a dark sentinel paced the ramparts above the little city, tucked down close to the water. A great tenor, summering in the north, came out on the upper deck of the big boat, and, baring his head, faced the moon and sang, Oh, the moon shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Elnor thought of the Limberlost, of Philip and her mother, and almost choked with the sobs that would rise in her throat. On the dock, a woman of exquisite beauty swept into the arms of Terence O'More. "'Oh, Freckles!' she cried. "'You've been gone a month!' Four days, Angel, just four days by the clock,' remonstrated Freckles. "'Where are the children?' "'Asleep, thank goodness, I'm worn to a thread. I never saw such inventive, active children. I can't keep track of them.' "'I've brought you help,' said Freckles. Here is the Limberlost girl in whom the bird woman is interested. Miss Comstock needs a rest before beginning her schoolwork for next year, so she came to us. You dear thing! How good of you! cried the angel. We shall be so happy to have you! In her room that night, in a beautiful cottage furnished with every luxury, Elnora lifted a tired face to the angel. Of course you understand there is something back of this, she said. I must tell you. Yes, agreed the angel. Tell me, if you get it out of your system, you will stand a better chance of sleeping. Elnora stood brushing the copper-bright masses of her hair as she talked. When she finished, the angel was almost hysterical. You insane creature, she cried. How crazy of you to turn him over to her. I know both of them. I've met them often. She may be able to make good her boast. But it is perfectly splendid of you. And, after all, really, it is the only way. I can see that. I think it is what I should have done myself, or tried to do. I don't know that I could have done it. When I think of walking off and leaving Freckles with a woman he once loved, to let her see if she can make him love her again, oh, it gives me a graveyard heart. No, I never could have done it. You are bigger than I ever was. I should have turned coward, sure. I am a coward, admitted Elnor. I am so sick. I'm afraid I shall lose my senses before this is over. I didn't want to come. I wanted to stay, to go straight into his arms, to bind myself with his ring, to love him with all my heart. It wasn't my fault that I came. There was something inside that just pushed me. She is beautiful. I quite agree with you. You can imagine how fascinating she can be. She used no arts on me. Her purpose was to cower me. She found she could not do that, but she did a thing which helped her more. She proved that she was honest, perfectly sincere in what she thought. 
She believes that if she merely beckons to Philip, he will go to her. So I'm giving her the opportunity to learn from him what he will do. She never will believe it from anyone else. When she is satisfied, I shall be also. But, child, suppose she wins him back. That is the supposition with which I shall eat and sleep for the next few weeks. Would one dare ask for a peep at the babies before going to bed? Now you are perfect, announced the angel. I should never have liked you all I can if you had been content to go to sleep in this house without asking to see the babies. Come this way. We named the first boy for his father, of course, and the girl for Aunt Alice. The next boy is named for my father and the baby for the bird woman. After this, we are going to branch out. Elnor began to laugh. Oh, I suspect there will be quite a number of them, said the angel serenely. I am told the more there are, the less trouble they make. The big ones take care of the little ones. We want a large family. This is our start. She entered a dark room and held aloft a candle. She went to the side of a small white iron bed in which lay a boy of eight and another of three. They were perfectly formed rosy children, the elder a replica of his mother, the other very like. Then they came to a cradle where a baby girl of almost two slept soundly and looked a picture. But just see here, said the angel. She threw the light on the sleeping girl of six. A mass of red curls swept the pillow. Line and feature the face was that of freckles. Without asking, Elnora knew the color and expression of the closed eyes. The angel handed Elnora the candle and, stooping, straightened the child's body. She ran her fingers through the bright curls and lightly touched her aristocratic little nose. The supply of freckles holds out in my family, you see, she said. Both of the girls will have them, and the second boy a few. She stood an instant longer, then, bending, ran her hand caressingly down a rosy bare leg, while she kissed the boyish red mouth. There had been some reason for touching all of them. The kiss fell on the lips, which were like freckles. To Elnora she said a tender good night, whispering brave words of encouragement, and making plans to fill the days to come. Then she went away. An hour later, there was a light tap on the girl's door. Come, she called, as she lay staring into the dark. The angel felt her way to the bedside, sat down, and took Elnora's hands. I just had to come back to you, she said. I've been telling Freckles, and he is almost hurting himself with laughing. I didn't think it was funny, but he does. He thinks it's the funniest thing that ever happened. He says that to run away from Mr. Ammon, when you have made him no promise at all, when he wasn't sure of you, won't send him home to her. It will set him hunting you. He says if you had combined the wisdom of Solomon, Socrates, and all the rest of the wise men, you could have chosen any course that would have sealed him to you so surely. He feels that now Ammon will perfectly hate her for coming down there and driving you away. And you went to give her the chance she wanted. Oh, well, Nora, it is getting funny. I see it, too. The angel rocked on the bedside. Elnora faced the darkened silence. Forgive me, gulped the angel. I didn't mean to laugh. I didn't think it was funny until all at once it came to me. Oh, dear, Elnora, it is funny. I've got to laugh. Maybe it is, admitted Elnora, to others. But it isn't very funny to me, and it won't be to Philip or to Mother. That was very true. Mrs. Comstock had been slightly prepared for stringent action of some kind by what Elnora had said. The mother instantly had guessed where the girl would go, but nothing was said to Philip. That would have been to invalidate Elnor's test in the beginning, and Mrs. Comstock knew her child well enough to know that she never would marry Ammon unless she felt it right that she should. The only way to know was to find out, and Elnor had gone to seek the information. There was nothing to do but wait until she came back, and her mother was not in the least uneasy, but that the girl would return brave and self-reliant as always. Philip Ammon hurried back to the Limberlost, strong in the hope that now he might take Elnor into his arms and receive her promise to become his wife. His first shock of disappointment came when he found her gone. In talking with Mrs. Comstock, he learned that Edith Carr had made an opportunity to speak with Elnor alone. He hastened down the road to meet her, coming back an agitated man. Then, search revealed the notes. His read, Dear Philip, I find that I am never going to be able to answer your question of this afternoon fairly to all of us when you are with me. So I am going away a few weeks to think over matters alone. I shall not tell you or even mother where I am going, but I shall be safe, well cared for, and happy. Please go back home and live among your friends just as you always have done. In honor before the first of September, I will write you where I am and what I have decided. Please do not blame Edith Carr for this and do not avoid her. 
I hope you will call on her and be friends. I think she is very sorry and covets your friendship at least. Until September, then, as ever, L. Nora. Mrs. Comstock's note was much the same. Ammon was ill with disappointment. In the arbor he laid his head on the table, among the implements of El Nora's loved work, and gulped down dry sobs he could not restrain. Mrs. Comstock never had liked him so well. Her hand involuntarily crept toward his dark head. Then she drew back. El Nora would not want her to do anything whatever to influence him. "'What am I going to do to convince Edith Carr that I do not love her, and El Nora that I am hers?' he demanded. "'I guess you have to figure that out yourself,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I'd be glad to help you if I could, but it seems to be up to you.' Eamon sat a long time in silence. "'Well, I have decided,' he said abruptly. "'Are you perfectly sure El Nora had plenty of money in a safe place to go?' "'Absolutely,' answered Mrs. Comstock. "'She has been taking care of herself ever since she was born, "'and she always has come out all right, so far. "'I'll stake all I'm worth on it that she always will.' I don't know where she is, but I'm not going to worry about her safety. I can't help worrying, cried Philip. I can think of fifty things that may happen to her when she thinks she is safe. This is distracting. First, I'm going to run up to see my father. Then I'll let you know what we have decided. Is there anything I can do for you? Nothing, said Mrs. Comstock. But the desire to do something for him was so strong with her she scarcely could keep her lips closed or her hands quiet. She longed to tell him what Edith Carr had said how it had affected Elnora, and to comfort him as she felt she could. But loyalty to the girl held her. If Elnora truly felt that she could not decide until Edith Carr was convinced, then Edith Carr would have to yield or triumph. It rested with Philip. So Mrs. Comstock kept silent, while Philip took the night limited, a bitterly disappointed man. By noon the next day he was in his father's offices, they had a long conference, but did not arrive at much until the elder Ammon suggested sending for Polly. Anything that might have happened could be explained after Polly had told of the private conference between Edith and Elnora. "'Talk about lovely woman!' cried Philip Ammon bitterly. "'One would think that after such a dose as Edith gave me, she would be satisfied to let me go my way. But no, not caring for me enough for herself to save me from public disgrace, she must now pursue me to keep any other woman from loving me. I call that too much!' I'm going to see her, and I want you to go with me, father. Very well, said Mr. Ammon. I will go. When Edith Carr came into her reception room that afternoon, gowned for conquest, she expected only Philip and him penitent. She came hurrying toward him, smiling, radiant, ready to use every allurement she possessed, and paused in dismay when she saw his cold face and his father. Why, Phil, she cried, when did you come home? "'I am not at home,' answered Philip. "'I merely ran up to see my father on business "'and to inquire of you what it was you said to Miss Comstock yesterday "'that caused her to disappear before I could get back to the Limberlost.' "'Miss Comstock disappear? Impossible!' cried Edith Carr. "'Where could she go?' "'I thought perhaps you could answer that, since it was through you that she went.' "'Phil, I haven't the faintest idea where she is,' said the girl gently." but you know perfectly why she went. Kindly tell me that. Let me see you alone, and I will. Here and now, or not at all. Phil! What did you say to the girl I love? Then Edith Carr stretched out her arms. Phil, I am the girl you love, she cried. All your life you have loved me. Surely it cannot be all gone in a few weeks of misunderstanding. I was jealous of her. I did not want you to leave me an instant that night for any other girl living. That was the moth I was representing. Everyone knew it. I wanted you to bring it to me. When you did not, I knew instantly it had been for her that you worked last summer, she who suggested my dress, she who had power to take you from me. When I wanted you most, the thought drove me mad, and I said and did those insane things. Phil, I beg your pardon. I ask your forgiveness. Yesterday she said that you had told her of me at once. She vowed both of you had been true to me, and Phil... I couldn't look into her eyes and not see that was the truth. Oh, Phil, if you understood how I have suffered, you would forgive me. Phil, I never knew how much I cared for you. I will do anything, anything. Then tell me what you said to Elnora yesterday that drove her, alone and friendless, into the night, heaven knows where. You have no thought for anyone save her? Yes, said Ammon, I have. Because I once loved you and believed in you, my heart ached for you. I will gladly forgive anything you ask. I will do anything you want. 
save resume our old relations. That is impossible. It is hopeless and useless to ask it. You truly mean that? Yes. Then find out from her what I said. Come, father, said Philip, rising. You were going to show Edith Miss Comstock's letter, suggested Mr. Ammon. I have not the slightest interest in Miss Comstock's letter, said Edith Carr. You are not even interested in the fact that she says you are not responsible for her going and that I am to call on you and be friends with you? That is interesting indeed, sneered Miss Carr. She took the letter, read, and returned it. She has done what she could for my cause, it seems, she said coldly. How very generous of her. Do you propose calling out Pinkertons and instituting a general search? No, replied Ammon. I simply propose to go back to the Limberlost and live with her mother until Elnora becomes convinced that I am not courting you and never will be. Then, perhaps, she will come home to us. Good-bye. Good luck to you always. End of chapter 23「Twenty Four of a Girl the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four, wherein Edith Carr wages a battle and Hart Henderson stands guard. Many people looked, a few followed, as Edith Carr slowly came down the main street of Mackinaw, pausing here and there to note the glow of color in one small booth after another, overflowing with gay curios. That street of packed white sand winding with the curves of the shore, outlined with brilliant shops and thronged with laughing, bareheaded people in outing costumes, was a picturesque and fascinating sight. Thousands annually made long journeys and paid exorbitant prices to take part in that pageant. As Edith Carr slowly progressed, she was the most distinguished figure of the old street. Her clinging black gown was sufficiently elaborate for a dinner dress. On her head was a large, wide, drooping-brimmed black hat with immense floating black plumes, while on the brim, and among the laces on her breast, glowed velvety deep red roses. Some way these made up for the lack of color in her cheeks and lips, and while her eyes seemed unnaturally bright to a close observer, they looked weary. Despite the effort she made to move lightly, she was very tired and dragged her heavy feet with an effort. She turned at the little street leading down to the dock and went out to meet the big lake steamer plowing up the straits from Chicago. Past the landing place, on to the very end of the pier she went, then sat down, leaned against a dock support, and closed her tired eyes. When the steamer came very near, she languidly watched the people lining the railing. Instantly she marked one lean, anxious face turned toward hers, and with a throb of pity she lifted a hand and waved to Hart Henderson. He was the first man off the boat, coming to her instantly. She spread her trailing skirts and motioned him to sit beside her. Silently they looked across the softly lapping water. At last she forced herself to speak to him. Did you have a successful trip? I accomplished my purpose. You didn't lose any time getting back. I never do when I'm coming to you. Do you want to go to the cottage for anything? No. Then let us sit here and wait until the Petoskey steamer comes in. I like to watch the boats. Sometimes I study the faces if I am not too tired. Have you seen any new types today? She shook her head. This has not been an easy day, Hart. And it's going to be worse, said Henderson bitterly. There's no use putting it off, Edith. I saw someone today. You should have seen thousands, she said lightly. I did, but of them all, only one will be of interest to you. Man or woman? Man. Where? Lakeshore Private Hospital. An accident? No, nervous and physical breakdown. Phil said he was going back to the Limberlost. He went. He was there three weeks, but the strain broke him. He has an old letter in his hands that he has handled until it is ragged. He held it up to me and said, You can see for yourself that she says she will be well and happy, but we can't know until we see her again, and that may never be. She may have gone too near that place her father went down. Some of that Limberlost gang may have found her in the forest. She may lie dead in some city morgue this instant, waiting for me to find her body. Hart, for pity's sake, stop! I can't, cried Henderson desperately. I'm forced to tell you. They are fighting brain fever. He did go back to the swamp, and he prowled at night and day. The days down there are hot now, and the nights wet with dew and cold. He paid no attention and forgot his food. A fever started, and his uncle brought him home. They've never had a word from her or found a trace of him. 
Mrs. Comstock thought she had gone to O'Moore's at Grand Rapids, so when Phil got sick she telegraphed there. They have been gone all summer, so her mother is as anxious as Phil. The O'Moores are here, said Edith. I haven't seen any of them, because I haven't gone out much in the few days since we came, but this is their summer home. Edith, they say at the hospital that will take careful nursing to save Phil. He is surrounded by stacks and maps and railroad guides. He is trying to frame up a plan to set the entire detective agency of the country to work. He says he will stay there just two days longer. The doctors say he will kill himself when he goes. He is a sick man, Edith. His hands are burning and shaky, and his breath was hot against my face. Why are you telling me? It was a cry of acute anguish. He thinks you know where she is. I do not. I haven't an idea. I never dreamed she would go away when she had him in her hand. I should not have done it. You said it was something you said to her that made her go. That may be, but don't prove that I know where she went. Henderson looked across the water and suffered keenly. At last, he turned to Edith and laid a firm, strong hand over hers. Edith, he said, do you realize how serious this is? I suppose I do. Do you want as fine a fellow as Phil driven any further? If he leaves that hospital now and goes out to the exposure and anxiety of a search for her, there will be a tragedy that no after-regrets can avert. Edith, what did you say to Miss Comstock that made her run away from Phil? The girl turned her face from him and sat still, but the man, gripping her hands and waiting in agony, could see that she was shaken by the jolting of the heart in her breast. Edith, what did you say? What difference can it make? It might furnish some clue to her action. It could not possibly. Phil thinks so. He has thought so until his brain is worn enough to give way. Tell me, Edith. I told her Phil was mine, that if he were away from her an hour and back in my presence, he would be to me as he always had been. Edith, did you believe that? I would have staked my life, my soul on it. Do you believe it now? There was no answer. Henderson took her other hand and gripping both of them firmly, he said softly, Don't mind me, dear. I don't count. I'm just old heart. You can tell me anything. Do you still believe that? The beautiful head barely moved in negation. Henderson gathered both her hands in one of his and stretched an arm across her shoulders to the post to support her. She dragged her hands from him and twisted them together. Oh, heart, she cried, it isn't fair. There is a limit. I have suffered my share. Can't you see? Can't you understand? Yes, he panted. Yes, my girl, tell me just this one thing yet, and I'll cheerfully kill anyone who annoys you further. Tell me, Edith. Then she lifted her great, dull, pain-filled eyes to his and cried, No, I do not believe it now. I know it is not true. I killed his love for me. It is dead and gone forever. Nothing will revive it. Nothing in all this world, and that's not all. I did not know how to touch the depths of his nature. I never developed in him those things he was made to enjoy. He admired me. He was proud to be with me. He thought, and I thought, that he worshipped me. But I know now that he never did care for me as he cares for her. Never. I can see it. I plan to lead society to make his home a place sought for my beauty and popularity. She plans to further his political ambitions, to make him comfortable physically, to stimulate his intellect, to bear him a brood of red-faced children. He likes her and her plans as he never did me and mine. Oh, my soul! Now are you satisfied? She dropped back against his arm, exhausted. Henderson held her and learned what suffering truly means. He fanned her with his hat, rubbed her cold hands, and murmured broken, incoherent things. By and by, great slow tears slipped from under her closed lids, but when she opened them, her eyes were dull and hard. What a rag one is when the last secret of the soul is torn out and laid bare, she cried. Henderson thrust his handkerchief into her fingers and whispered, Edith, the boat has been creeping up. It's very near. Maybe some of our crowd are on it. Hadn't we better get away from here before it lands? If I can walk, she said. Oh, I'm so dead tired, heart. Yes, dear, said Henderson soothingly. Just try to get past the landing before the boat anchors, if I only dared carry you. They struggled through the waiting masses, but directly opposite the landing, there was a backward movement in the happy laughing crowd, the gangplank came down with a slam, and people began hurrying from the boat. Crowded against the fish house on the dock, 
Henderson could only advance a few steps at a time. He was straining every nerve to protect and assist Edith. He saw no one he recognized near them, so he slipped his arm across her back to help support her. He felt her stiffen against him and catch her breath. At the same instant, the clearest, sweetest male voice he ever had heard called, "'Be careful there, little man!' Henderson shot a swift glance toward the boat. Terence O'Moore had just stepped from the gangplank, escorting a little daughter, so like him it was comical. There followed a picture not easy to describe. The angel in the full flower of her beauty, richly dressed, a laugh on her cameo face, the setting sun glinting on her gold hair, escorted by her eldest son, who held her hand tightly and carefully watched her steps. Next came Elnora, dressed with equal richness, a trifle taller and slenderer, almost the same type of coloring, but with different eyes and hair, facial lines and expression. She was led by the second O'More boy, who convulsed the crowd by crying, "'Tearful, Elnora! Don't oo be tappin' in de water!' People surged around them, purposely closing them in. "'What lovely women! Who are they? It's the O'Mores. The lightest one is his wife. Is that her sister? No, it is his. They say he has a title in England.' Whispers ran fast and audible, as the crowd pressed around the party, an opening was left beside the fish sheds. Edith ran down the dock. Henderson sprang after her, catching her arm and assisting her to the street. "'Up the shore! This way!' she panted. "'Everyone will go to dinner the first thing they do!' They left the street and started around the beach, but Edith was breathless from running, while the yielding sand made hard walking. "'Help me!' she cried, clinging to Henderson. He put his arm around her, almost carrying her out of sight into a little cove walled by high rocks at the back, while there was a clean floor of white sand and logs washed from the lake for seats. He found one of these with a back rest, and hurrying down to the water, he soaked his handkerchief and carried it to her. She passed it across her lips, over her eyes, and then pressed the palms of her hands upon it. Henderson removed the heavy hat, fanned her with his, and wet the handkerchief again. Heart, what makes you? she said wearily. My mother doesn't care. She says this is good for me. Do you think this is good for me, Hart? Edith, you know I would give my life if I could save you this, he said, and could not speak further. She leaned against him, closed her eyes, and lay silent so long the man fell into panic. Edith, you are not unconscious, he whispered, touching her. No, just resting. Please don't leave me. He held her carefully, softly fanning her. She was suffering almost more than either of them could bear. "'I wish your boat was here,' she said at last. "'I want to sail fast, with the wind in my face.' "'There is no wind. I can get my motor around in a few minutes. Then get it. Lie on the sand. I can phone from the first booth. It won't take but a little while.' Edith lay on the white sand, and Henderson covered her face with her hat. Then he ran to the nearest booth and talked imperatively. Presently he was back bringing a hot drink that was stimulating. Shortly, the motor ran close to the beach and stopped. Henderson's servant brought a rowboat ashore and took them to the launch. It was filled with cushions and wraps. Henderson made a couch and soon, warmly covered, Edith sped out over the water in search of peace. Hour after hour, the boat ran up and down the shore. The moon arose and the night air grew very chilly. Henderson put on an overcoat and piled more covers on Edith. "'You must take me home,' she said at last. "'The folks will be uneasy.' He was compelled to take her to the cottage with the battle still raging. He went back early the next morning, but already she had wandered out over the island. Instinctively, Henderson felt that the shore would attract her. There was something in the tumult of rough little Hurin's waves that called to him. It was there he found her, crouching so close the water the foam was dampening her skirts. "'May I stay?' he asked. "'I have been hoping you would come,' she answered. "'It's bad enough when you are here.' but it is a little easier than bearing it alone. Thank God for that, said Henderson, sitting beside her. Shall I talk to you? She shook her head. So they sat by the hour. At last she spoke. Of course you know there's something I've got to do, Hart. You have not, cried Henderson violently. That's all nonsense. Give me just one word of permission. That is all that is required of you. Required? You grant, then, that there is something required. One word, nothing more. Did you ever know one word could be so big, so black, so desperately bitter? Oh, heart! No. But you know it now, heart! Yes. 
"And still you say that it is required." Henderson suffered unspeakably. He twisted and fumed impotently. At last he said: "If you had seen and heard him, Edith, you too would feel that it is required. Remember " "No, no, no!" she cried. "Don't ask me to remember even the least of my pride and folly. Let me forget!" She sat silent a long time. "Will you go with me?" she whispered. "Of course." At last she arose. "I might as well give up and get it over," she faltered. That was the first time in her life that Edith Carr ever had proposed to give up anything she wanted. Help me, Hart! Henderson started around the beach, assisting her all he could. Finally he stopped. Edith, there is no sense in this. You are too tired to go. You know you can trust me. You wait in any of these lovely places and send me. You will be safe and I'll run. One word is all that is necessary. But I've got to say that word myself, Hart. Then write it and let me carry it. The message is not going to prove who went to the office and sent it. That is quite true, she said, dropping wearily, but she made no movement to take the pen and paper he offered. Hart, you write it, she said at last. Henderson turned away his face. He gripped the pen while his breath sucked between his dry teeth. Certainly, he said when he could speak. Mackinaw, August twenty seventh, 1908. Philip Ammon, Lakeshore Hospital, Chicago. He paused with suspended pen and glanced at Edith. Her white lips were working, but no sound came. Miss Comstock is at Terence O'Moore's on Mackinac Island, prompted Henderson. Edith nodded. Signed, Henderson, continued the big man. Edith shook her head. Say, she is well and happy, and signed Edith Carr, she panted. Not on your life, flashed Henderson. For the love of mercy, Hart, don't make this any harder. It is the least I can do, and it takes every ounce of strength in me to do it. Will you wait for me here, he asked. She nodded, and, pulling his hat lower over his eyes, Henderson ran around the shore. In less than an hour he was back. He helped her a little farther to where the devil's kitchen lay cut into the rocks. It furnished places to rest and cool water. Before long his man came with the boat. From it they spread blankets on the sand for her and made chuffing dish tea. She tried to refuse it, but the fragrance overcame her and she drank ravenously. Then Henderson cooked several dishes and spread an appetizing lunch. She was young, strong, and almost famished for food. She was forced to eat. That made her feel a world better. Then Henderson helped her into the boat and ran it through shady coves of the shore where there were refreshing breezes. When she fell asleep, the girl did not know, but the man did. Sadly in need of rest himself, he ran that boat for five hours through quiet bays, away from noisy parties, and where the shade was cool and deep. When she awoke, he took her home, and as they went, she knew that she had been mistaken. She would not die. Her heart was not even broken. She had suffered horribly. She would suffer more. But eventually the pain must wear out. Into her head crept a few lines of an old opera. Hearts do not break, they sting and ache, for old love's sake, but do not die, as witnesseth the living eye. That evening they were sailing down the straits before a stiff breeze, and Henderson was busy with the tiller when she said to him, Heart, I want you to do something more for me. You have only to tell me, he said. Have I only to tell you, Hart? she asked softly. Haven't you learned that yet, Edith? I want you to go away. Very well, he said quietly, but his face whitened visibly. You say that as if you had been expecting it. I have. I knew from the beginning that when this was over you would dislike me for having seen you suffer. I have grown my Gethsemane in a full realization of what was coming, but I could not leave you, Edith, so long as it seemed to me that I was serving you. Does it make any difference to you where I go? I want you where you will be loved and good care taken of you. Thank you, said Henderson, smiling grimly. Have you any idea where such a spot might be found? It should be with your sister at Los Angeles. She always has seemed very fond of you. That is quite true, said Henderson, his eyes brightening a little. I will go to her. When shall I start? At once. Henderson began to tack for the landing, but his hand shook until he scarcely could manage the boat. Edith Carr sat watching him indifferently, but her heart was throbbing painfully. Why is there so much suffering in the world? She kept whispering to herself. Inside her door, Henderson took her by the shoulders almost roughly. For how long is this, Edith, and how are you going to say goodbye to me? She raised tired, pain-filled eyes to his. I don't know for how long it is, she said. It seems now as if it had been a slow eternity. 
I wish to my soul that God would be merciful to me and make something snap in my heart as there did in Phil's that would give me rest. I don't know for how long, but I'm perfectly shameless with you, Hart. If peace ever comes and I want you, I won't wait for you to find it out yourself. I'll cable, marconigraph, anything. It's for how I say goodbye. Any way you please. I don't care in the least what happens to me. Henderson studied her intently. In that case, we will shake hands, he said. Goodbye, Edith. Don't forget that every hour I'm thinking of you and hoping all good things will come to you soon. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of A Girl the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five, wherein Philip finds Elnora and Edith Carr offers a yellow emperor. Oh, I need my own violin! cried Elnora. This one may be a thousand times more expensive and much older than mine, but it wasn't inspired and taught to sing by a man who knew how. It don't know beans, as Mother would say about the Limberlost. The guests in the O'More music room laughed appreciatively. Why don't you write your mother to come for a visit and bring yours? suggested Freckles. I did that three days ago, acknowledged Elnora. I'm half expecting her on the noon boat. That is one reason why this violin gets worse every minute. There's nothing at all the matter with me. Splendid, cried the angel. I've begged and begged her to do it. I know how anxious these mothers become. When did you send? What made you? Why didn't you tell me? when three days ago what made me you why didn't i tell you because i can't be sure in the least that she will come mother's the most individual person she never does what everyone expects she will she may not come and i didn't want you to be disappointed how did i make you asked the angel loving alice it made me realize that if you cared for your girl like that with miss joe moore and three other children possibly my mother with no one might like to see me I know good and plenty I want to see her, and you told me to so often I just sent for her. Oh, I do hope she comes. I want her to see this lovely place. I have been wondering what you thought of Mackinaw, said Freckles. Oh, it is a perfect picture, all of it. I should like to hang it on the wall so I could see it whenever I wanted to. But it isn't real, of course. It's nothing but a picture. These people won't agree with you, smiled Freckles. That isn't necessary, retorted Elnora. They know this, and they love it, but you and I are acquainted with something different. The limber lost his life. Here it is a carefully kept park. You motor, sail, and golf, all so secure and fine. But what I like is the excitement of choosing a path carefully, and the fear that the quagmire may reach out and suck me down, to go into the swamp naked-handed and wrest from it treasures that bring me books and clothing, and I like enough of a fight for things that I always remember how I get them. I even enjoy seeing a canny old vulture eyeing me as if it were saying, Where well, the sting of the rattler, lest I pick your bones as I did old limbers. I like sufficient danger to put an edge on things. This is all so tame. I should have loved it when all the homes were cabins and watchers for the stealthy Indian canoes patrolled the shores. You wait until mother comes, and if my violin isn't angry with me for leaving it, tonight we shall sing you the song of the limberlost. You shall hear the big gold bees over the red, yellow, and purple flowers, bird song, wind talk, and the whispers of sleepy Snake Creek as it goes past you. He will know. Elnora turned to Freckles. He nodded. Who better? he asked. This is secure while the children are so small, but when they get larger, we are going farther north into real forest where they can learn self reliance and develop backbone. Elnora laid away the violin. Come along, children, she said. We must get at that backbone business at once. Let's race to the playhouse. With the brood at her heels, Elnora ran, and for an hour lively sounds stole from the remaining spot forest on the island, which lay beside the O'More cottage. Then Terry went to the playroom to bring Alice her doll. He came racing back, dragging it by one leg and crying, There's company! Someone has come that Mama and Papa are just tearing down the house over. I saw it through the window. It could not be my mother yet, mused Elnora. Her boat is not due until twelve. Terry, give Alice that doll. It's a man person. I don't know him, but my father is shaking his hand right straight along, and my mother is running for a hot drink and a cushion. It's a kind of a sick person, but they are going to make him well right away. Anyone can see that. This is the best place. I'll go tell him to come lie on the pine needles in the sun and watch the sails go by. That will fix him. Watch sails go by, chanted little brother, and fix him. Elnora, fix him, won't you? 
"'I don't know about that,' answered Elnor. "'What sort of a looking person is he, Terry?' "'A beautiful white person, but my father's going to color him up. "'I heard him say so. "'He's just out of the hospital, and he is a bad person "'cause he ran away from the doctors and made them awful angry. "'But father and mother are going to doctor him better. "'I didn't know they could make sick people well. "'Ay do anything!' boasted little brother. "'Before Elnora missed her, Alice, who had gone to investigate, "'came flying across the shadows and through the sunshine waving a paper. "'She thrust it into Elnora's hand.' "'There is a man-person, a stranger-person,' she shouted. "'But he knows you. He sent you that. "'You are to be the doctor. He said so. "'Oh, do hurry. I like him heaps.' "'Elnora read Edith Carr's telegram to Philip Ammon "'and understood that he had been ill, "'that she had been located by Edith, who had notified him. "'In so doing, she had acknowledged defeat. "'At last, Philip was free. "'Elnora looked up with a radiant face.' "'I like him heaps myself,' she cried. "'Come on, children, we will go tell him so.' Terry and Alice ran, but Elnora had to suit her steps to the little brother, who was her loyal esquire, and would have been heartbroken over desertion and insulted at being carried. He was rather dragged, but he was arriving, and the emergency was great. He could see that. "'She's coming!' shouted Alice. "'She's going to be the doctor!' cried Terry. "'She looked just like she'd seen angels when she read the letter,' explained Alice. "'She likes you heaps. She said so,' danced Terry. "'Be waiting. Here she is.' Elnora helped little brother up the steps, then deserted him and came at a rush. The stranger person stood holding out trembling arms. "'Are you sure at last run away?' asked Philip Ammon. "'Perfectly sure,' cried Elnora. "'Will you marry me now?' "'This instant, that is, any time after the noon boat comes in.' "'Why such unnecessary delay?' demanded Ammon. "'It is almost September,' explained Elnora. "'I sent for Mother three days ago. "'We must wait until she comes, "'and we either have to send for Uncle Wesley and Aunt Margaret "'or go to them. "'I couldn't possibly be married properly without those dear people.' "'We will send,' decided Ammon. "'The trip will be a treat for them. "'Oh, more, would you get off a message at once?' "'Everyone met the noon boat. "'They went in the motor because Ammon was too weak to walk so far.' As soon as people could be distinguished at all, Elnor and Philip sighted in an erect figure, with a head like a snowdrift. When the gangplank fell, the first person across it was a lean, red-haired boy of eleven, carrying a violin in one hand and an enormous bouquet of yellow marigolds and purple asters in the other. He was beaming with broad smiles until he saw Ammon. Then his expression changed. "'Aw, oh, say!' he exclaimed reproachfully. "'I bet you Aunt Margaret is right. He is going to be your beau.' Elnor stooped to kiss Billy as she caught her mother. "'There, there!' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'Don't knock my headgear into my eye. "'I'm not sure I've got either hat or hair. "'The wind blew like bism coming up the river.' She shook out her skirt, straightened her hat, and came forward to meet Philip, who took her into his arms and kissed her repeatedly. Then he passed her along to Freckles and the Angel, to whom her greetings were mingled with scolding and laughter over her wind-blown hair. "'No doubt I'm a precious spectacle,' she said to the angel. "'I saw your pa a little before I started, and he sent you a note. "'It's in my satchel. "'He said he was coming up next week. "'What a lot of people there are in this world, "'and what on earth are all of them laughing about? "'Did none of them ever hear of sickness or sorrow or death? "'Billy, don't you go to playing Indian or chasing woodchucks "'until you get out of those clothes. "'I promised Margaret I'd bring back that suit good as new.' "'Then the O'More children came crowding to meet Elnora's mother.' "'Merry Christmas!' cried Mrs. Comstock, gathering them in. "'Got everything right here but the tree, "'and there seems to be plenty of them a little higher up. "'If this wind would stiffen just enough more to blow away the people "'so one could see this place, I believe it would be right decent-looking.' "'See here,' whispered Elnora to Ammon. "'You must fix this with Billy. "'I can't have his trip spoiled.' "'Now here is where I dust the rest of them,' complacently remarked Mrs. Comstock "'as she climbed into the motor-car for her first ride, "'in company with Ammon and Little Brother.' "'I've been the one to trudge the roads and hop out of the way of these things for quite a spell.' She sat very erect as the car rolled into the broad main avenue, where only stray couples were walking. Her eyes began to twinkle and gleam. Suddenly she leaned forward and touched the driver on the shoulder. "'Young man,' she said, "'just you toot that whistle suddenly and shave close enough a few of those people so that I can see how I look when I leap for ragweed and snake fences.' The amazed chauffeur glanced questioningly at Ammon, who slightly nodded. A second later, there was a quick honk and a swerve at a corner. A man engrossed in conversation grabbed the woman to whom he was talking and dashed for the safety of a lawn. 
The woman tripped in her skirts and as she fell the man caught and dragged her. Both of them turned red faces to the car and berated the driver. Mrs. Comstock laughed in unrestrained enjoyment. Then she touched the chauffeur again. That's enough, she said. It seems a mite risky. A minute later she added to Ammon, If only they had been carrying six pounds of butter and ten dozen eggs apiece, wouldn't that have been just perfect? Billy had wavered between Elnora and the motor, but his loyal little soul had been true to her, so the walk to the cottage began with him at her side. Long before they arrived, the little Omores had crowded around and captured Billy, and he was giving them an expurgated version of Mrs. Comstock's tales of Bigfoot and Adam Poe, boasting that Uncle Wesley had been in the camps of Mesh and Gomitia near Waka Kakona before he got religion and dressed like white men, while the mighty prowess of Snap as a woodchuck hunter was done full justice. When they reached the cottage, Ammon took Billy aside, showed him the emerald ring, and gravely asked his permission to marry Elnora. Billy struggled to be just, but was going hard with him, when Alice, who kept close enough to hear, intervened. "'Why don't you let them get married?' she asked. "'You are much too small for her. You wait for me.' Billy studied her intently. At last he turned to Ammon. "'Ah, oh, well, go on, then,' he said gruffly. "'I'll marry Alice.' Alice reached her hand. "'If you got that settled, let's put on our Indian clothes, get the boys, and go to the playhouse.' "'I haven't got any Indian clothes,' said Billy ruefully. "'Yes, you have,' explained Alice. "'Father got you some coming from the dock. "'You can put them on in the playhouse. "'The boys do.' "'Billy examined the playhouse with gleaming eyes. "'Never had he encountered such possibilities. "'He could see a hundred amusing things to try, "'and he could not decide which to do first. "'The most immediate attraction seemed to be a dead pine "'held perpendicularly by its fellows, "'while its bark had decayed and fallen, "'leaving a bare, smooth trunk.' "'If we just had some grease that would make the dandiest pole to play Fourth of July with,' he shouted. The children remembered the Fourth. It had been great fun. "'Butter's grease. There's plenty in the refrigerator,' suggested Alice, speeding away. Billy caught the cold roll and began to rub it against the tree excitedly. "'How are you going to get it greased to the top?' inquired Terry. Billy's face lengthened. "'That's so,' he said. "'The thing is to begin at the top and grease down. I'll show you.' Billy put the butter in his handkerchief and took the corners between his teeth. He climbed the pole, greasing it as he slid down. "'Now, I got to drive first, he said, "'because I'm the biggest and so I have the best chance. "'Only the one that goes first hasn't hardly any chance at all "'because he has to wipe off the grease on himself "'so the others can get up at last. "'See?' "'All right,' said Terry. "'You go first and then I will, and then Alice. "'Phew, it's slick. He'll never get up.' Billy wrestled manfully, and when he was exhausted, he boosted Terry, and then both of them helped Alice, to whom they awarded a prize of her own doll. As they rested, Billy remembered. "'Do your folks keep cows?' he asked. "'No, we buy milk,' said Terry. "'Gee, then what about the butter? Maybe your ma needs it for dinner.' "'No, she don't,' cried Alice. "'There's stacks of it. I can have all the butter I want.' "'Well, I'm mighty glad of it,' said Billy. "'I didn't just think. I'm afraid we've greased our clothes, too.' "'That's no different,' said Terry. "'We can play what we please in these things.' "'Well, we ought to be all dirty and bloody and have feathers on us to be real Indians,' said Billy. Alice tried a handful of dirt on her sleeve, and it streaked beautifully. Instantly, all of them began smearing themselves. "'If we only had feathers,' lamented Billy. Terry disappeared and shortly returned from the garage with a feather duster. Billy fell on it with a shriek. Around each one's head he firmly tied a twisted handkerchief and stuck inside it a row of stiffly upstanding feathers. Now if we just only had some pokeberries to paint us red, we'd be real, for sure enough, Indians, and we could go on the warpath and fight all the other tribes and burn a lot of them at the stake. Alice sidled up to him. Would huckleberries do? she asked softly. Yes, shouted Terry, wild with excitement. Anything that's a color. Alice made another trip to the refrigerator. Billy crushed the berries in his hands and smeared and streaked all their faces liberally. "'Now are we ready?' asked Alice. Billy collapsed. "'I forgot the ponies. You've got to ride ponies to go on the warpath.' "'You ain't neither,' contradicted Terry. "'It's the very latest style to go on the warpath in a motor. Everybody does. They go everywhere in them. They are much faster and better than any old ponies.' Billy gave one genuine whoop. "'Can we take your motor?' Terry hesitated. "'I suppose you are too little to run it,' said Billy. "'I am not,' flashed Terry. "'I know how to start and stop it, and I drive lots for Stevens. "'It is hard to turn over the engine when you start.' "'I'll turn it,' volunteered Billy. "'I'm strong as anything.' "'Maybe it will start without. "'If Stevens has just been running it, sometimes it will. "'Come on, let's try.' 
Billy straightened up, lifted his chin, and cried, Whoopee! 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 The little O'Moores stared in amazement. Why don't you come on and whoop? demanded Billy. Don't you know how? You're a great Indian. You got to whoop before you go on the warpath. You want to kill a bat, too, and see if the wind is right. But maybe the engine won't run if we wait to do that. You can whoop anyway, all together now. They did whoop, and after several efforts, the cry satisfied Billy, so he led the way to the big motor and took the front seat with Terry. Alice and little brother took the back. Will it go? asked Billy, or do we have to turn it? It will go, said Terry, as the machine gently slid out into the avenue and started under his guidance. This is no war path, scoffed Billy. We got to go a lot faster than this, and we got to whoop. Alice, why don't you whoop? Alice arose, took hold of the seat in front, and whooped. If I open the throttle, I can't squeeze the bulb to scare people out of our way, said Terry. I can't steer and squeeze, too. We'll whoop enough to get them out of the way. Go faster, urged Billy. Billy also stood, lifted his chin, and whooped like the wildest little savage that ever came out of the West. Alice and little brother added their voices, and when he was not absorbed with the steering gear, Terry joined in. Faster, shouted Billy. Intoxicated with the speed and excitement, Terry threw the throttle wider and the big car leaped forward and shot down the avenue. In it four black, feather-bedecked children whooped in wild glee until suddenly Terry's war cry changed to a scream of panic. The lake is coming! Stop! cried Billy. Stop! Why don't you stop? Paralyzed with fear, Terry clung to the steering gear and the car sped onward. You little fool! Why don't you stop? screamed Billy, catching Terry's arm. Tell me how to stop! A bicycle shot along beside them, and Freckles, standing on the pedal, shouted, Pull out the pin in that little circle at your feet. Billy fell on his knees and tugged, and the pin yielded at last. Just as the wheel struck the white sand, the bicycle steered close. Freckles caught the lever, and with one strong shove set the brake. The water flew as the car struck current, but luckily it was shallow and the beach smooth. Hub deep, the big motor stood quivering as Freckles climbed in and backed it to dry sand. Then he drew a deep breath and stared at his brood. Terence, would you kindly be explaining? he said at last. Billy looked at the panting little figure of Terry. I guess I better, he said. We were playing Indians on the warpath and we hadn't any ponies and Terry said it was all the style to go in automobiles now, so we... Freckles' head went back and he did some whooping himself. I wonder if you realize how nearly you came to being four drowned children, he said gravely after a time. Oh, I think I could swim enough to get most of us out, said Billy. Anyway, we need washing. You do indeed, said Freckles. I will hand this procession to the garage, and there we will remove the first coat. For the remainder of Billy's visit, the nurse, chauffeur, and every servant of the O'More household had something of importance on their minds, and Billy's every step was shadowed. I have Billy's consent, said Philip to Elnor, and all the other consent you have stipulated. Before you think of something more, give me your left hand, please. Elnora gave it gladly, and the emerald slipped on her finger. Then they went together into the forest to tell each other all about it and talk it over. "'Have you seen Edith?' asked Damon. "'No,' answered Elnora. "'But she must be here, or she may have seen me when she went to Petoskey a few days ago. Her people have a cottage over on the bluff, but the angel never told me until today. I didn't want to make that trip, but the folks were so anxious to entertain me, and it was only a few days until I intended to let you know myself where I was.' and I was going to wait just that long, and if I didn't hear then, I was getting ready to turn over the country. I can scarcely realize yet that Edith sent me that telegram. No wonder it's a difficult thing to believe. I can't express how I feel for her. Let us never again speak of it, said Ammon. I came nearer feeling sorry for her last night than I have yet. I couldn't sleep on that boat coming over, and I couldn't put away the thought of what sending that message cost her. I never would have believed it possible that she would do it. But it is done. We will forget it. I scarcely think I shall, said Elnora. It is the sort of thing I like to remember. How suffering must have changed her. I would give a great deal to bring her peace. Henderson came to see me at the hospital a few days ago. He's gone a pretty wild pace, but if he had been held from youth by the love of a good woman, he might have lived differently. There are things about him one cannot help admiring. I think he loves her, said Elnora softly. He does. He always has. He never made any secret of it. He will cut in now and do his level best, but he told me that he thought she would send him away. He understands her thoroughly. Edith Carr did not understand herself. She went to her room after her goodbye to Henderson, lay on her bed, and tried to think why she was suffering as she was. 
it is all my selfishness, my unrestrained temper, my pride in my looks, my ambition to be first, she said. That is what has caused this trouble. Then she went deeper. How does it happen that I am so selfish, that I never controlled my temper, that I thought beauty and social position the vital things of life, she muttered. I think that goes a little past me. I think a mother who allows a child to grow up as I did, who educates it only for the frivolities of life, has a share in that child's ending. I think my mother has some responsibility in this, Edith Carr whispered to the knight. But she will recognize none. She would laugh at me if I tried to tell her what I have suffered in the bitter, bitter lesson I have learned. No one really cares but Hart. I have sent him away, so there is no one, no one. Edith pressed her fingers across her burning eyes and lay still. He is gone, she whispered at last. He would go at once. He would not see me again. I should think he never would want to see me any more. But I will want to see him. My soul, I want him now. I want him every minute. He is all I have, and I've sent him away. Oh, these dreadful days to come, alone. I can't bear it. Heart, heart, she cried aloud. I want you. No one cares but you. No one understands but you. Oh, I want you. She sprang from her bed and felt her way to her desk. Get me someone at the Henderson Cottage, she said to Central, and waited, shivering. They don't answer. They are there. You must get them. Turn on the buzzer. After a time, the sleepy voice of Mrs. Henderson answered. "'Has Hart gone?' panted Edith Carr. "'No, he came in late and began to talk about starting to California. He hasn't slept in weeks to amount to anything. I put him to bed. There is time enough to start to California when he wakens. Edith, what are you planning to do next with that boy of mine? Will you tell him I want to see him before he goes?' "'Yes, but I won't wake him.' "'I don't want you to. Just tell him in the morning.' "'Very well. You will be sure.' sure hart was not gone edith fell asleep she arose at noon the next day took a cold bath ate her breakfast dressed carefully and leaving word that she had gone to the forest she walked slowly across the leaves it was cool and quiet there so she sat where she could see him coming and waited she was thinking hard and fast henderson came swiftly down the path a long sleep food and edith's message had done him good he had dressed in new light flannels that were becoming Edith arose and went to meet him. "'Let us walk in the forest,' she said. They passed the old Catholic graveyard and went back into the deepest wood of the island, back where all shadows were green, all voices of humanity ceased, and there was no sound save the whispering of the trees, a few bird notes, and squirrel rustle. There Edith seated herself on a mossy old log, and Henderson studied her. He could detect a change. She was still pale and her eyes tired, but the dull, strained look was gone. He wanted to hope, but he did not dare. Any other man would have forced her to speak. The mighty tenderness in Henderson's heart shielded her in every way. "'What have you thought of that you wanted yet, Edith?' he asked slightly as he stretched himself at her feet. "'You!' Henderson lay tense and very still. "'Well, I am here. Thank heaven for that!' Henderson sat up suddenly, leaning toward her with questioning eyes. Not knowing what he dared say, afraid of the hope which found birth in his heart, he tried to shield her and at the same time to feel his way. "'I am more thankful than I can express that you feel so,' he said. "'I would be of use of comfort to you if I knew how, Edith.' "'You are my only comfort,' she said. "'I tried to send you away. I thought I didn't want you. I thought I couldn't bear the sight of you because of what you have seen me suffer. But I went to the root of this thing last night, heart, and with self in mind as usual, I found that I could not live without you.' Henderson began breathing lightly. He was afraid to speak or move. I face the fact that all this is my own fault, continued Edith, and came through my own selfishness. Then I went further back and realized that I am as I was reared. I don't want to blame my parents, but I was carefully trained into what I am. If Elnora Comstock had been like me, Phil would have come back to me. I can see how selfish I looked to him and how I appear to you if you would admit it. Edith said henderson desperately there is no use to try to deceive you you have known from the first that i found you wrong in this but it's the first time in your life i ever thought you wrong about anything and it's the only time i ever will understand i think you the bravest most beautiful woman on earth the one most worth loving i'm not to be considered in the same class with her i don't grant that but if i did you must remember how i compare with phil he's my superior at every point there's no use in discussing that you wanted to see me edith what did you want? I didn't want you to go away. Not at all. 
Not at all, not ever. Not unless you take me with you, Hart. She slightly extended one hand to him. Henderson took that hand, kissing it again and again. Anything you want, Edith, he said brokenly. Just as you wish it. Do you want me to stay here and go on as we have been? Yes, only with a difference. Can you tell me, Edith? First, I want you to know that you are the dearest thing on earth to me right now. I would give up everything else before I would you. I can't honestly say that I love you with the love you deserve. My heart is too sore. It's too soon to know. But I love you some way. You are necessary to me. You are my comfort, my shield. If you want me as you know me to be, heart, you can consider me yours. I give you my word of honor. I will try to be as you would have me, just as soon as I can. Henderson kissed her hand passionately. Don't, Edith, he begged. Don't say those things. I can't bear it. I understand everything will come right in time. Love like mine must bring a reward. You will love me some day. I can wait. I am the most patient fellow. But I must say it, cried Edith. I, I think, heart that i have been on the wrong road to find happiness i plan to finish life as i started it with phil and you see how glad he was to change he wanted the other sort of girl far more than he ever wanted me and you heart honest now i'll know if you don't tell me the truth would you rather have a wife as i plan to live life with phil or would you rather have her as elnora comstock intends to live with him edith cried the man edith of course you can't say it in plain english said the girl you are far too chivalrous for that you needn't say anything i am answered if you could have your choice you wouldn't have a society wife either in your heart you like the smaller home of comfort the furtherance of your ambitions the palatable meals regularly served and little children around you i'm sick of all we have grown up to heart when your hour of trouble comes there is no comfort for you i'm tired to death you find out what you want to do and be, that is a man's work in the world, and I will plan our home with no thought save your comfort. I'll be the other kind of a girl as fast as I can learn. I can't correct all my faults in one day, but I'll change as rapidly as I can. God knows I will be different too, Edith. You shall not be the only generous one. I will make all the rest of life worthy of you. I will change too. Don't you dare, said Edith Carr, taking his head between her hands and holding it against her knees while the tears slid down her cheeks. Don't you dare change, you big heart and splendid lover. I'm little and selfish. You are the very finest, just as you are. Henderson was not talking then, so they sat through a long silence. At last he heard Edith draw a quick breath, and lifting his head, he looked where she pointed. Up a fern stalk climbed a curious-looking object. They watched breathlessly. By lavender feet clung a big, pursy, lavender-splotched yellow body. Yellow and lavender wings began to expand and take on color. Every instant, great beauty became more apparent. It was one of those double brooded freaks which do occur on rare occasions, or merely an equally imperialist moth that in the cool, damp northern forest had failed to emerge in June. Edith Carr drew back with a long, shivering breath. Henderson caught her hands and gripped them firmly. Steadily, she looked the thought of her heart into his eyes. By all the powers you shall not, swore the man. You have done enough. I will smash that thing. Oh, no, you won't, cried the girl, clinging to his hands. I'm not big enough yet, Hart, but before I leave this forest, I shall have grown to breadth and strength to carry that to her. She needs two of each kind. Phil only got her one. Edith, I can't bear it. That's not demanding. Let me take it. You may go with me. I know where the Omar's cottage is. I have been there often. I'll say you sent it. You may watch me deliver it. Phil may be there by now. I hope he is. I should like him to see me do one decent thing by which to remember me. I'll tell you that is not necessary. Not necessary, cried the girl, her great eyes shining. Not necessary. Then what on earth is the thing doing here? I'd just have boasted that I would change, that I would be like her, that I would grow bigger and broader. As the words are spoken, God gives me the opportunity to prove whether I am sincere. This is my test heart, don't you see it? If I am big enough to carry that to her, you will believe that there is some good in me. You will not be loving me in vain. This is an especial providence, man. By my strength, help me as you always have done. Henderson arose and shook the leaves from his clothing. He drew Edith Carr to her feet and carefully picked the mosses from her skirts. He went down to the water and moistened his handkerchief to bathe her face. No, a dust of powder, he said when the tears were washed away. From a tiny book, Edith tore leaves that she passed over her face. Oh, go on, cried Henderson, critically eyeing her. You look almost half as lovely as you really are. 
Edith Carr drew a wavering breath. She stretched one hand to him. Hold tight, heart, she said. I know they handle these things, but I would quite as soon touch a snake. Henderson clenched his teeth and held steadily. The moth had emerged too recently to be troublesome. It climbed on her fingers quietly and obligingly clung there without moving. So, hand in hand, they went down the dark forest path. But when they came to the avenue, the first person they met paused with an ejaculation of wonder. The next stopped also, and everyone following. They could make little progress on account of marveling, interested people. A strange excitement took possession of Edith. She began to feel proud of the creature. "'Do you know,' she said to Henderson, "'this is growing easier every step. "'Its clinging is not disagreeable as I thought it would be. "'I feel as if I were saving it, protecting it. "'I'm proud that we are taking it to be put into a collection or a book. "'It seems like doing a thing worth while. "'Oh, Hart, I wish we could work together at something "'for which people would care as they seem to for this. "'Hear what they say, see them lift their little children and look at it.' "'Edith, if you don't stop,' said Henderson, "'I will take you in my arms and kiss the face half off you here on the avenue. "'You are adorable.' "'Don't you dare!' laughed Edith Carr. "'The color rushed to her cheeks and a new light leaped in her eyes. "'Oh, heart!' she cried. "'Let's work. Let's do something. "'That's the way she makes people love her so. "'There's the place, and thank goodness there is a crowd.' "'You darling!' whispered Henderson as they passed up the walk. Her face was rose-flushed with excitement, and her eyes shone. "'Hello, everyone!' she cried as she came on the wide veranda. "'Only see what we found up in the forest. We thought you might like to have it for some of your collections.' She held out the moth as she walked straight to Elnora, who arose to meet her, crying, "'How perfectly splendid! I don't even know how to begin to thank you!' Elnora took the moth. Edith shook hands with all of them and asked Philip if he were improving. She said a few polite words to Freckles and the Angel, declined to remain on account of an engagement, and went away gracefully. "'Well, bully for her,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'She's a little thoroughbred after all.' "'That was a mighty big thing for her to be doing,' said Freckles in a hushed voice. "'If you knew her as well as I do,' said Philip Ammon, "'you would have a better conception of what that cost.' "'It was a terror,' cried the Angel. "'I never could have done it.' "'Never could have done it,' echoed Freckles. Why, Angel, dear, that's the one thing of all the world you would have done. I have to take care of this, faltered Elnora, hurrying for the door to hide the tears which were rolling down her cheeks. I must help, said Ammon, disappearing also. Elnora, he called, catching up with her, take me where I can cry too. Wasn't she great? Superb, exclaimed Elnora. I have no words. I feel so humbled. So do I, said Ammon. I think a great deed like that always makes one feel so. Now are you happy? I'm Speakably happy, answered Elnora. The end. End of chapter 25. End of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter.